Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining me today with uh, some of my Art Toronto uh, artists. You know, Art Toronto was established uh, 20 years ago in Toronto. And for the last 20 years, I've um, always with a lot of excitement taken part in Art Toronto. And this year, unfortunately, but very understandably, Art Toronto went virtual. And it didn't give it didn't give us really a big enough platform. Everyone uh, who we represented for the fair had put a lot of work into it. So I thought it would be an ideal time to reach out to all of you to present their work again. So I'm happy to say that I'm joined by uh, a, a number of artists who are going to be with us at Art Toronto. And I'd like to just uh, say hi to them. I'd like to say hi to Susan Edgerly. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Susan. And to Laura Donifer. Hello, everybody. Hey, Laura. And to Tim Tate. Hi, folks. Proud to be here. And to Tutsinski. Twitch will be with us in one moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, some of the artists couldn't join us, but we are still going to have a short video from them. And as well, we will. Uh, show images of their work. So I'd like to um, to start out and introduce you to Susan Edgerly. So, hey Susan, here I am Hi, again. Sandy. Hi Hello. everybody. Hey. Hi. So Susan and I really do have a long history together. We were actually just chatting about it before we got started. Um, Susan started her career in 1982. I started mine in 1984. And since 1984, one way or another, our lives have always been um, going on the same path, whether it's professionally representing her in the gallery or enjoying and celebrating all the wonderful things that life has to bring. Uh, so I'm delighted that um, Susan is with us today. Uh, before I show you her first work, I just wanted to tell you that Last year in 2019, Susan was, received the Governor General's Award, which is the most important award that an artist can receive in the visual arts in Canada. And for uh, those of you who aren't from Canada, I should tell you that the Governor General is the Queen's representative uh, in Canada. And uh, even though it's not a political appointment, it is an important appointment. And um, I want to thank Susan again because she invited me on three wonderful days with her family and with Irene Frolic to be part of that great adventure. And it, it was one of the most exciting things I had done. And Susan deservedly um, received that award. So I'd like to start out by, sh well, showing you one of Susan's pieces. Let me just show you that first. I'm going to show you the video first, actually. You know what? <laughs> Thank goodness Daniel's here and you prompted me. And Daniel is here. Thank you. I pulled a blank on that one. But we're going to see the video from the Governor General's awards. Glass is, for me, a poetic material. I've never really been attracted to making objects with glass. I've very much been attracted to using glass as a means of expression, often in very different ways from one group of work to the other. I work in many different techniques and each technique speaks to a certain idea that I've been trying to express at that time in a series of work. All those series are connected through the material, but even though each one appears to be different, there's like an underlying thematic that pulls them through. When I work with glass, I feel like I'm writing a story. 
It's very much like you would write with a pen, but for me it's writing with a material. A lot of my inspiration is originally from the natural world. When I find something in nature, often mm -hmm. I'll just pick it up and look at it. The more I see what's in front of me in this small object that I found on the ground, the more I feel the sense of connectedness to the world at large. The more it kind of inspires me to think of broader things. Past a few years, I've been working on a specific series of work called Light and Shadow. I found that juxtaposition and that duality very interesting. Using these immaterial nuances of light and shadow has elevated my work into an ethereal domain that I find very fascinating. The shadow becomes like a drawing to the glass. It really started me thinking about how the invisible could be made visible. That relationship has always been in a very fundamental way at the heart of my work. For me, the quality of glass being unlimited really responded to something very fundamental in myself. I've never really liked to have limits. I don't like to be defined as one thing or another. I really feel that I am one element of a larger whole, and that really also is what I'm now reflecting in my work, and that makes me feel good. Thank you, Susan. Well, thank now you, Andy. This pin piece for itself. Perhaps you'd like to talk a little bit about this piece, about the pin piece. Well, actually, uh, I just want to say hello to everyone and uh, to thank you so much, Sandy, for this wonderful initiative. You're always filled with uh, really superb ideas of getting work out into the public, and this is one additional way to do it. So this piece actually is the piece that you just saw in the uh, film uh, that was created. And I just do want to say just very briefly um, how honored I was uh, to receive the award, but also the, the film was created by a videographer named Tommy Grisevic, which I just want to say he had a wonderful eye and to thank the Canada Council for the Arts for commissioning it. So it's really wonderful to see the work in your space. Uh, the lighting is fabulous because what it does show in life, which is very interesting, is a lot of the shadowing of the work, which is very, very important mm -hmm. to the actual piece. And what's very interesting about this is this is like an artificial gallery lighting and you really see the nuance and the depth and that has a lot to do with my work. So I'm really uh, delighted to see how beautifully lit it is. And uh, it's not always easy on Zoom, as you know, and it just, it, it just looks fantastic. So Daniel and I had spoken a little bit about showing some of the slides or images from the actual art fair booth. So if we want to go to those, you will see this piece again, but in a, in a different context. So here it is under natural light just to show you how important light is for, for the work. So my work is about finding and creating connection and it explores concepts of cyclical transformation, mystery and continuity. As you see, I have an organic, intuitive and poetic approach to glass and I work in abstraction. My practice encompasses both installation work like this wall piece, as well as large site-specific commissions, of which I have done several wonderful projects with you, Sandra, over the years. The circular installation is created of flamework glass elements, and it balances an ethereal world of light and shadow with a world of solid materiality, which is that of the transparent glass. It also balances delicacy with scale and creates a sense of wonder.
the work is made to be experienced as the details over time, both in the shadow play as you see the changing and the movement can be subtle or striking, but they are always changing. The wall installations are about connectedness and finding meaning in those connections they, that are, we find within ourselves, of course, and with, between us and the world. In the series, light, as I have mentioned, is a vital component. It is an extraordinary transformative force which brings the work to life and completes both the composition and the interpretation. It draws with its shadow the alternate hidden nature of the transparent flamework glass forms, making each dependent on the other. The compositions are only complete once the work has been lit. The shadows become as drawings to the glass, uniting the material and the immaterial. Just stay on the slide for a moment. The completed works act as a fulcrum to light, continuously transforming, and is created to be observed over time. Once installed, the glass responds to the changes in its environment, and the shadow drawings shift through time and season. So here you see like a little bit more of the installation of each element and in, in the close-up. So they're organized in delicate and fragile relationship. They find their balance and union one element at a time, building the strength of their relationship to each other once they have been completely installed. So you can go to the next one now, please. The next slide. And here's a very close detail of what the work is. So the pieces are made of hundreds of large <laughs> branch shaped forms and thousands of tiny elements put together. But it is the glass and the combination of the shadow drawings over time with both natural and artificial light that gives the, the piece its tremendous movement and, per, and sense of perspective. So we can go to the next slide, please. Another work for the show is the suspended installation, which is the series I'm currently working on now, titled Inside the Sky. It is a reversal of perspective where small fused glass forms are suspended and floating just above a dark reflective surface. Here, it is the gentle ambient movement of a person walking by or just like a slight breeze in the, in the space that activates the work with a delicate motion and sound. When lit, the work appears to suspend almost invisibly between the earth and the sky. You can go to the next slide, please. The delicate motion and depth of the reflection allows the viewer a path to an inner personal landscape where looking outward is really looking inwardly. And the piece becomes very contemplative and mesmerizing through its details and gentle motion. Next, please. Here is a close-up of the glass elements, almost as a lattice work, yet they are extremely strong. And although this particular work is currently installed in a beautiful home, I am also working on several others at this moment. You can go to the next slide, please. So for the final two works that were presented in the Toronto Art Fair, these are from the Seed Sower series and they are from the late 1990s and up to 2000. And they were selected from my archives. And I find this series to be extremely pertinent for these times as their themes relate to individuality and community. The series was inspired by the natural world through close observation of the cycles and their changes and in discovering of its many wonders. Next, please. For this series, I chose to work with a sand casting technique where the hot molten glass actually touches the earth, becoming crusty and textured. You cannot see into the forms. They are absolutely opaque and appear to quietly guard tremendous internal potential. Can I see the next slide, please? In working with multiples, the repeated forms draw attention to their similarities, yet remain absolutely unique in the variety of their details. They also allow for flexibility in their installation relationships 
as you just saw in the, the previous two slides in the groups of nine, there were the same, in, the same elements set in different uh, compositions. The total number of elements can be infinite. And I have installed groups as small as three and as large as 50, depending on the space. Next, please. Once placed together, the individual elements create the work, a final whole. They become inseparable. They're made to act together as a symbiosis, unifying each individual to create a stronger, complete relationship. The next image, please. Inspired by forms of seeds, shoots, and roots, through metaphor, these sculptures address the beginning of life and the cyclical nature of existence, finding strength in their abundance and togetherness. The next image, please. In a similar way, our lives are filled with our own unique versions of cyclical transformation and cycles, universal ones, such as birth and loss. Next, please. <laughs> Joy and sorrow, healing and forgiveness. In these moments, there is so very much that we share and have in common. Next, please. So working with glass for me is my way to understand and express this collective human experience. So thank you very much for being here. And again, thank you very much, Sandy, for the opportunity. Well, you know, I love your work, Susan. And uh, it, it seems to me though, your two series that you showed are so different, so extreme from the sand cast yeah. to the pin. What was the evolution that took you from one extreme to the other? Well, essentially, uh, that's a very interesting point because when I do change series, often it is an evolution and it can be in extreme. But I, for me as a creative artist, I see glass as a whole and I see it very much in it's options and opportunities to express. It's a, it's a visual material, and I really try to use it as a visual language. So in the sandcast pieces, which were now uh, approximately 20 years ago, the opaqueness was really trying to protect the, uh, the light, if you want, in the inner core of the piece. Mm -hmm. Whereas the transition was when I started to want to reveal that light and how could I do it in a delicate manner. And I tried at first just to introduce some very small elements of flamework glass and they really drew the light. But as I started to introduce them, I became really um, fascinated with the fact that these tiny tendrils, if you want, could actually be the composition itself. So it's like going from the outer surface of things to the inner surface of things. Mm -hmm. And that really was a transition. And it also transitions very much in my own artistic um, mm -hmm. expression. So through my work over the years, I've noticed I've gone initially very inwardly to very layered and surface, very textured to a, a more uh, light expression in, in terms of my, and more universal, I, I would put uh, out there uh, more universally expressive in terms of just the ethereal quality uh, of our lives. Well, 12 years ago, when I moved into my new home, Susan uh, created a beautiful pin piece for me, for my home. And it's the first thing I see when I come home at night. And it's the last thing I see when I leave. And it's one of those things that when I see it, it still actually makes my heart beat. I, oh, I feel it when I see it. Oh, that's so um, wonderful. Thank you very much. And it's, it's a, it was an honor for me and to, to make that specifically for you. But also I find for people who do uh, 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 have my work, uh, collect my work, that it is, it is a very important moment for them, uh, mm -hmm. one that they, they live with daily and appreciate daily and watch the changes of it daily as well. Yes. And it's very moving for me as an artist to know that. It's not just a, a, an object or a thing. It's something that engages with, with people. And I really find that my work is very much about not pictures, but really the living with it, the experiencing of it, that uh, where it becomes very important. So thank you very much. Thank you very oh, much well, for that. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you. Um,
So I'm going to go on and I would like to introduce to you, um, Vivian Wang could not be with us today, um, but we, she did create a video for us and we do have some pieces that we're going to show you. So um, Daniel, do you want to start with the, um, or Adrian, Adrian, can you put that video on for me, please? Hi, welcome to our virtual tour. I'm Vivian Wang's assistant, Christina Sisko, coming at you from the beautiful city of West Palm Beach. We hope you enjoy. Welcome to the studio of Vivian Wang. Right up these steps, you'll get an exclusive sneak peek of her sculptural process. Because of the many components involved from start to finish, it takes a few months to complete one piece. Luckily, they're made in sets, and multiple sculptures will be worked on at a time. Let's begin in the mold room. Here, collective press molds form a clay base for different body parts. These clay impressions are then individually refined and customized to make a unique one-of-a-kind sculpture. Once the head, hands, and feet are sculpted in clay, they're cast in a plaster and silica mold. When the mold dries, the clay is removed. This mold is then sealed and filled with glass granules. Now we're ready for a firing. The temperatures are monitored frequently to keep up with a consistent schedule. Inside the kiln, the glass granules will melt and conform to the mold. The glass will look something like this. A rough texture forms on the surface during the cooling process. To give these pieces a smoother finish, they go through a series of wet shaving and sanding techniques called cold working. Cold working is a safe way to sculpt glass with precision. Four different grits are used to achieve a smooth, silky look. Now we're getting to the finishing touches. Once the body is painted, accents are added like gold leaf, semi-precious stones, and Swarovski crystals. The glass head, hands, and feet are assembled into the clay body. And there you have it. Thanks for watching. So she made that seem very simple, but I think it's far from, from simple. So you can see the glass heads and the feet and hands. And it's very, very elaborate. Um, semi-precious stones. You can see a Vivian's uh, past career as a fashion designer, perhaps show its way, a fashion designer and someone who was inspired by historic paintings and sculptures because I, these are very true uh, to historic, um, to, to um, historic figures that we've seen. They're just mesmerizing. I think every time that I come close to one of these figures, I see much more. And I'm sorry that Vivian isn't here to explain more of the technique and um, more of her, her philosophy. But I know that she is inspired by uh, historic textile designs and by history as well. So with each uh, figure that we have, there will be some historic background on, on the pieces. Thank you, Daniel. Let me go around to the back. Beautiful. So they're very extravag extravagantly embellished to say the least. 
a very contemporary slant on an ancient on ancient history. We have just recently started to sell Vivian's work and we did have uh, more work than this and we've been very fortunate to sell some of them very quickly. So we're delighted to um, have Vivian with us in the gallery. Thanks, Dan. So the next artist that we were going to meet today was to Tobias Moll. Unfortunately, Tobias at the last minute was not able to, um, to be here with us today. However, it wasn't that long ago that we visited Tobias in his studio in uh, Denmark. So we're able to, um, in a moment, play uh, some excerpts from that. But here's a beautiful five twill sculpture. I mean, this work is unique only to Tobias, and it really draws you in. I wish that Tobias was here describing it all to you, but um, we enjoy it so much. This is our five-part flax world collection, and the piece over here is actually the one we saw the making of on the film. So that's how it's, it's ended up turning out. Um, I've done a number of these pieces over the years, um, and I have hundreds of different patterns that I have developed. Um, and, um, you know, when I do something like this, um, it's, you know, this is, I think this is something you can only do if you are, know how to put glass, you know. I don't think anyone can sort of design something on the line there and there and there. You know, it's, it's uh, really something, the science is something I developed very much um, during, during the process. You know, it's, uh, it can be very often a mistake, you know, something that goes wrong, but it shows some little detail mm -hmm. that in the right context could be interesting, you know, that has that, that, that quality of textile that I'm looking for. So it's really, for me, a matter of, um, you know, trying to keep my eyes open when I blow glass and, and look at those small details appearing right in front of me. And, um, and then it's a matter of uh, cultivating it, really. Um, it's a gorgeous piece. So Tobias, you said you do hundreds of different patterns. When you begin a piece, do you know what patterns you're going to use? Yes. Okay. And I, sometimes I hope, hope it would be better, but, but you no. Know, but I, I uh, yeah, when I actually do a piece like this one, so we know exactly what we're doing, what we're mm -hmm. going for. But, but, but um, the, you know, it's not like, um, you know, people think, oh, it must be so inspiring the view from the studio. And I guess it is, but, but really it's, it's a lot of work. And it's, it's uh, you know, it's not like I'm jumping out of bed in the morning and I have a brand new idea. It's, it's really about... Uh, starting from where I left yesterday and trying to cultivate that or make it better, you know. So mm -hmm. constantly trying to improve uh, this, this or look, search for 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 new patterns, really, you know. Yeah. Sometimes it just doesn't happen for a while and other times it's it's too easy, you know. It's uh, That's how it is. Uh, so anyway, that's how this five-part piece turned out. And then going back to your question about the lights, um, the light box thing started several years ago for me, and it's it's really uh, has turned out to be the way I can actually show my work. Um, uh, you know, the details that I'm looking for. You know, it's very difficult sometimes. To, if I didn't have that, it would be almost impossible to see them. Um, so you know, searching for finer and finer details of the light became more and more important. Mm -hmm. And um, so. You know, it's it's a it's a nice way. There's always this constant issue for collectors and people buying to how, how does it work, what it's going to look like when it gets home, and and uh, that's kind of solves this problem as well. It, it's presented exactly as I want to, and it's going to look exactly like that uh, in someone's home. Uh, it's nice, dimmable, and you, you can you know you can change it to, to the, according to the surroundings. Um, and it's, it's uh, you know, it also allowed me to keep sh searching for even smaller details, you know, because of the light. Yeah. Glass and light is, is very connected in general, I think. 
Um, the, the, same, um, the same series, I, mean, I look at these as, you know, um, they could be plants, they could be bushes, trees, something that grows. You know, I'm trying to get away from patterns that looks stylistic. You know, um, I want them to, to look more organic and, and like they, they are going somewhere. Uh, this, you know, so in, in, you know, from that idea that it could be leaves, for instance, I made this series over here, which is newer. Um, this is a seven-part black leaf collection. <laughs> And um, uh, that was, you know, trying to make it a leaf gesture or something that could be sandwich straws or uh, leaves or something like a feathers maybe. Um, it's it's obviously the same, uh, the same process, the same uh, technique using the different um, uh, tricks I have for patterning and the same colors. Um, but they are made of solid, so it's not a blown piece. This this is just oh, a, a solid piece that is pulled out um, and installed like this. Yeah. And Actually, the, the scale looks to be somewhat smaller as well. Uh, it's the same height, actually. Is it? Uh, yeah, same height, but just a, a little more narrow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was a question from someone who, you, I guess, answered it, but how does your time in nature influence and your pattern, so obviously it does. It does, but not in a, in, a, in a very direct way. It's not that I, I, I mean, I, I look at these and I, I think it's the whole discussion about inspiration is, is tricky. I'm not, I don't get inspiration and I, I you know, I go directly back and, and try to copy what I see, but I think it's more like a, a feeling that you build up, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, so um, yeah. So if these pieces are solid. Those, those um, are all solid, yeah. They're, they're, they're mounted on this uh, little foot, uh, and that's, you know, you can screw it into the, the actually base of, of okay. this, so, so they're not going to fall at all. Yeah. Very nice. Very beautiful, nice. beautiful new direction. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was a little worried about moving away from the, the vessel making, you know, I had to take a deep breath. What Tobia said must be true. It must be hard to go in a new direction as an artist. You know, when you're recognized for uh, something in particular, then to go in a completely new direction is such a risk. Um, but Daniel's going to show us uh, some of the available pieces of Tobias's that we have. We have this three-part piece and the five-part piece. And then there's a few other pieces that uh, aren't in the gallery right now. I do like this new direction. I don't know how everyone else feels, but I like it very much. And Dan, I think you have some slides, or Adrian, some slides of the other work that's available. Here we go. So this is the same um, piece that we just saw in the studio. which is the new direction. And I do love this red part twill piece. Um, Tobias hasn't made too many works in this color. We have this piece in the gallery as well. I love it very much. And um, this beautiful, I believe it's called a conch bowl, beautiful shape, very simple. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm sorry that um, Tobias wasn't with us but you can see we have some beautiful work, but I'm happy to say that we're moving over to Tim Tate's work and Tim <laughs> is live with us. Tim, hi. Hi, everyone. Well, I, I love Tim this. No, pardon? Go ahead. no, no, I was I gonna say you're, you, that's all. yeah, well, you're new to the gallery and we're so happy to have your work. And this is the first time that you're showing in Canada. So uh, it's a pleasure and I'm sure that all our Canadian uh, watchers or people online are delighted to meet you and see what you do, Tim. Well, I, I really appreciate being asked. I've, like you pointed out, I've never shown in Canada. I've shown extensively in the United States and uh, right. Italy and, and England, but this is my first time joining you all. So I'll tell you a little bit uh, about my work. 
and we're going to focus today on our Endless Mirror series. And while I'm making these pieces, I see myself as a time traveler in a way. I like to bridge centuries between the 19th and 21st century. Uh, and it's probably because of all the Jules Verne I read as a child, but I have that aesthetic that blends over most of those. I, I tend to use round frames and that's because in the past I've had lots of different types of frames. And one day Glenn Adamson, who's, I, I don't know if you know him in Canada, he's the senior scholar at Yale. Uh, he was at the Victorian Albert and then became the director of the Museum of Arts and Design in Manhattan. And he pulled me aside and said, you know why your round ones work so well? And I said, why? He said, because they present a portal into another world, into another dimension. And inside that portal, anything can happen. And I really kind of put that in over, my, over time to really, uh, I really wanted to embrace that. Uh, I kind of, uh, almost in a, almost, well, my things, they're very contemporary, but they always have an overlay of Victorian techno, uh, techno fetishism, which is where I really go with my work. I like the four foot tunnels because they uh, beg to look into. We know, it's, we know that that's an illusion behind us, but you cannot help but see four feet in there. You can try to tell yourself, oh, this isn't real, and you will still see that yeah. four foot tunnel. And I can vote for that. <laughs> there are several in the gallery. I'm showing this from behind you because I do a lot of uh, commissions, especially floral commissions. So I now, Tim, to... Tim, I'm really sorry to interrupt, but your screen share is not working. Can you try to oh, set it up I again? Didn't share it all. I didn't share it yet, but now I'm going oh, to. Oh, pardon me. <laughs> I was just chatting here, so uh, I will all take right. that right uh, now. Ah, that's much better. <laughs> I should really pay attention to that. All right, let me move this out of the way. Okay. It's a, okay. There we are. So now I will move forward in. We'll show you some of the work that's at the gallery now. Uh, this is the Bodhisattva of Compassion. Uh, to really examine the depth of this, I have a little quick video on this. Uh, the Bodhisattva of Compassion is a Buddha that has achieved enlightenment. Uh, frequently, it's called the Buddha of a thousand hands. That's what you're seeing there. And even though they've achieved enlightenment because of their great heart, they remain behind to help others. And in this day and age, with so many frontline workers helping, and everybody, you know, there's grandmothers taking care of kids with the parents work, there's healthcare workers at the hospitals in dangerous conditions, all these people who work selflessly for the good of all of us. And that definitely is what the Bodhisattva of Compassion does. And you see, not only you see that depth, but you see the calmness that's inside of these as well. I'll move Definitely. on here. That one's, uh, that, one's, that one's here. This one's in the gallery. I saw Daniel had put it up on his. This was uh, a nod to um, two things. One, my being a child of the 60s, and I like black light, and mm -hmm. also to kind of Italian reticello. This is a little Tobias nod. There you go, Tobias. Ah, there you go. So uh, I decided to do a, a painted piece. Painting typically can be very flat to me because uh, I tend to work in three dimensions, but I did this one kind of just to show you how the depth that you can get out of these endless mirrors. You see the UV lights on the side. Um, and I just love the way that whenever you have UV on this type of paint, it looks like the paint itself is self illuminated. And so that's what gives these UV tunnels such huge depth with a little nod to the reticello as it's coming around. And again, you get that beautiful feeling of awe when you're walking past it. Next, I have uh, this piece. Um, in the United States, we have, you know, a lot of issues with gun violence. I joined a, a, a movement called Social Realism back in the late 90s, early 2000s, where artwork was tended to be about these kind of social realities. Uh, on this piece here, you see uh, a ring of men surrounding a, a uterus-shaped six-gun center. For every man there in the United States, 1,000 people are killed in the United States from gun violence every year. And for every gun you see in that uterus shape, a child dies every single day. So I put this in there. The mirrors are over their heads to show you that not only do we lose those people, but the generations that might have come from them. 
Uh, this piece won the uh, second place prize in the London Contemporary Art Prize and also was shown at Glass Dress last year with Ai Weiwei and Karen Lamont. Uh, and so it's just an interesting piece and now is available now that it's finished the museum circuit it was doing. Uh, this piece has been up, this piece is a very personal piece to me. It's been up in the Tacoma Glass Museum now for two years. COVID gave me an extra year, so that's thumbs up to COVID for that anyway. Um, on this piece, we'll go to this piece on there. So COVID is a pandemic now, but this is my second pandemic. And the first pandemic I lived through killed so many friends of mine. I hope I'm luckier with this pandemic. Um, so on this one, as you look through with that depth, remember these four foot tunnels are only in our minds. They're imaginary locations and places. And because of that, whatever the dynamics, the science, whatever magic we want to imbue that tunnel with is in our head to do with as we see fit. And in this one, everyone I ever knew that passed, there they are alive again, saying, hey, thank you for remembering us you know, here we're, we're okay where we are, don't worry, and uh, please never forget. So this is an on to those people that were lost in that first and this pandemic as well. Uh, this, I do love doing collaborations. Uh, these are two of my favorite artists on earth, uh, Jason Jacobardi and Jennifer Caldwell. Uh, this is, I know, a favorite of a lot of people in this particular show. Mm -hmm. uh, a lovely piece called Honey Home. I'll get the video started on that. Uh, you know, you almost can't go wrong with beautiful flowers, honeycombs, and bees. Lots and lots of bees. The reason that the, we use the bees in this particular one is, again, what do bees do? They work for the collective good. So what I like about this piece is all of us as human beings, we are in this art world, we're in this world, we are humans beyond artists. And right now, all of us are trying to work for the common good of the people. That's a, that came from Jennifer and Jason, and I wholeheartedly say that's why we love this piece. We spent a long time figuring out exactly the right uh, content on it, and it came out so beautiful. And of course, the money shot is this one showing how far we have to go, but it's just a beautiful central tunnel that goes back forever, yeah. filled with those bees. Uh, I, I can't tell you how much I love this piece and love those two artists. They are amazing artists. If you haven't seen their work, you should at some point. I'm going to switch here. I'm going to jump to a whole different series here that we are just starting. I, I like to uh, partner with new artists who need a hand to get into the world that we have. This is Terry Swinhart, and we have made a casting of every letter of the sign language alphabet. This one says, voila. Uh, we did that as a nod to our Canadian, French-speaking Canadian <laughs> North. We were going to do Magnifique, but we just didn't have time. I barely got this is only cell phone because it is. We finished it last night. So wow. uh, just to give you an idea how much detail is in these pieces, that is actually one of the hands there. And you see every poor... Unfortunately, I discovered that age spots also have depth, and I didn't even know I had age <laughs> spots, but I, apparently I do, because on the back of this, there are definitely age spots for my hand, but uh, I wanted to use a particularly large hand because, you know, my hands are large and they're a little oversized, so it was perfect to put these in, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be mounting whole walls of poetry. You know, here's one that's just a small one with, voila, single words. Text and words and phrases have much power, so it depends on how we use those. You know, we'll use our powers for good. And that is the end of my screen share. Right. Any questions? No, oh, I, I can only tell you how much I'm drawn to this particular piece. And there isn't anyone that comes into the gallery that it's like a magnet. Mm -hmm. They're really drawn into the work, Tim. It's so so unique. Thank you so very much. I love making every one of mine. I, I, I've always been drawn to those pieces that give me awe and magic. And if I can say nothing else about my work, they are imbued with mm -hmm. awe and magic. Do you, do you want to tell us a little bit about when you started um, on this particular path? 
uh, the glass path or the endless well, mirror? You could give us even a little bit of history, what you started with. Take a few minutes, okay? Sure, I started in 1989. So Laura had just turned 52, I think. And <laughs> <laughs> kidding, kidding. I started in 1989 and had worked um, quietly without any kind of ambition to do anything in the art world. And then in 1999, my mother passed away and I blew a series of large 18 inch sacred hearts with little flames on top and inside was to hold her ashes afterwards. Uh, I made, I think it was nine of those just as a test to see which one I wanted to use. They were shown in a fair and immediately went to, one went to the Renwick and they were on the front page of the Washington Post and all of a sudden I wow. thought, oh my God, I better do something with the, you know, with the, in her will, she actually stipulated go to Penland for a concentration. Hmm. So I honored that and went to Penland for a concentration. And that probably changed my life in the terms of what I allowed myself to do at that point. And I allowed myself to make many types of work. I tend to work in mixed media. I see a perfect thread to me in all of them. <laughs> it may look like they're jarringly different, but in my mind, they're very connected. Uh, and I'm so honored and proud to be part of this class community. I can't even believe when I looked at these names, I was up with them today, and I uh, can't thank everybody enough who supported me over the years. And I have a, a very loyal following, and I thank all of you. Several of them are here today, and thank you all for coming for that. Wow. Thank you, and hopefully we'll get a good following for you in Canada. Thank you so much. I'm, okay, I, I'm, married, to, I'm married to a Canadian, so You're I think I'm going to up here oh. next month. I don't know. Okay. So, you know, for the last four years, whenever we've done Art Toronto, uh, Wilfred Grutens has always visited the city, which has been great. He loves good art, he loves the city, and he loves good food. So we always have a good time together. Uh, he was traveling and couldn't join us today. Um, so we are going to um, show you um, a video. But before I do that, I want to mention something. At Art Toronto, every year they write up the top 10 uh, pieces to see at Art Toronto. And every year, Wilfred is in that top 10, which is pretty cool. He loves it and we're happy about it as well. So uh, Daniel's now showing you the couple of pieces, the two pieces that we have on display right now. And we have a number of other available works that he'll show you in just a minute or two. Uh, there we go. Hello everybody, nice to see you in my home and on my working place as well. I sit here for hours and do my dots and uh, my little lines on the glass and I can do it at home because the format of my sheets, glass sheets are like this and this is really handle bar in my home so I don't have square meters something like that so only little pieces and I do it as I do it piece for piece to getting uh, the form of a uh, cube uh, and just in the moment I have to do with a, with a size like this and so it's very comfortable for me to sit here um, I want to tell you a little bit about my inspiration which comes from uh, colors of calyx plants stones life forms from the sea such as selfish jellyfish and sea animal and create an inexhaustible inspirational source for me um, i have to tell you the illustrated book kunst from der natur art forms in nature by the german zoologist ernst hecker had an immense influence on the fantasy world of my youth and is once again reflected in my current work. I decide on the shapes and colors that I paint onto the single paints with innumer innumerable dots and lines during <coughs> the start of the work process. At the same time, I have the three dimensional resulting shapes in my mind's eye. For me, um, that is going to be too, a little bit of meditation, I would say. And I hope that my artifacts I create in their own aesthetics give the viewer as much 
pleasure and fascination as I enjoy, thereby sparing any further questions. Just enjoy my work. Okay, thanks for listening. So, he makes it sound very simple. Uh, it's very magical, though, no matter how you look at it, and very much inspired by the solar system, at least that's how I see it, or inspired by the bottom of the sea. Um, as I say, it's a very simple concept, but the execution is anything but simple. This is a favorite piece of mine. Just look right into that piece. It's amazing. I love that. And then, Dan, I know that you have some after you finish this piece, we have some slides of other available work. Yeah, that piece is one heavy piece too, solid glass. Okay, so Adrian, you can put up the other slides, thank you. So this is a new, um, a new way that uh, Wilfred has of uh, displaying the cubes and it's very, very effective. Mm. It's a beautiful piece. Mm -hmm. That remind. I mean, there's a lot of, I, I hate to use the word action, but there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. It's like oh, being in the middle of a hurricane or a tornado, I guess. Mm -hmm. Isn't that fabulous? Beautiful. I love that piece. We call this the eyeball. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what Wilfred calls it, but that's what we call it. Very reminiscent of the sea, the bottom of the sea. And I believe this is the piece that we saw Wilfred working on. And it's a spectacular piece. Love the colors. Mm -hmm. Looks like the solar system, totally. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Adrian. And unfortunately, Martin Janecki is not here either, but we do have two new pieces that just arrived in the gallery last week. Um, so Martin is one of the leading glass sculptors in the world. There's no question. And as I say, these two pieces are very recent, very haunting. Um, and it's just amazing his attention to detail, how he possibly gets that detail and the realistic features, pretty unbelievable. And then we go over to Redhead. It's a very strong piece. Beautiful. Wow. And I think, Dan, we have a, um, once you go around that, Adrian, we can put the um, video. We have a video with Martin talking about his artistic technique. I don't really draw much, but I've been always um, more like a 3D guy, you know, I always have a... Um, some uh, pretty accurate vision of what the piece should um, stand for, what the motion should be in, and, and I'm just trying to push the work into that. So it's really on a um, long process, you know. But I always have a pretty a clear picture of the of, of the finished piece, and I'm trying to like um, match it with the with the glass. So. So you have your vision. So it's not really like happy accident. So it's I I I've never really been working like that, you know. So I always have a like vision and I know what I want to make and that's why it takes me uh, much more time than probably others. <laughs> <laughs> really? How long how long would it take you when you're when you're making a piece? I, what's the process? Uh, the process it's, it really depends you know when I work on a, um, 
like today we worked for about six hours straight and we made a bust, you know, which I, um, I um, yesterday I made a two hands which are attached together like this. And then today I made a bust for it. So it's the pieces um, join um, pretty much stand next to each other, but they belong into each other. So yesterday it was eight hours, nine hours. Today it was six hours just mm -hmm. on the bus. And there's a lot of, um, you know, the roughing out the shape takes a long time. And then um, working on the features of the face. And uh, I don't know, it's just like you, you always go back to this uh, different stages where you work. And, Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of like it's never ending. It's, I think it's like the, the piece is never finished. You just pretty much just give up. So you give up. <laughs> How do you keep your stamina up? It's it gonna be exhausting. exhausting. Like this. Like this. <laughs> I think that's a good way for all of us to keep our stamina up. <laughs> it helps me. I know. So fear. Yeah. Isn't that mesmerizing? It's so realistic. Yeah. It yeah. really is. So now we actually have live from Kingston, Ontario. Where's Laura? Laura Donifer. Now, uh, this is, I've known Laura. I also, Laura, we go back to 1984 easily. This would have been the first year that you, you were going to show with us at Art Toronto. We were really excited. So I have to take a rain check because I'm sure by next year we will be back on the uh, convention floor again. And I look forward to you being there. Would be so, lovely. Yes. So tell us a little bit about life in Kingston. Well, I guess Can you'd you hear tell me? Us. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I know okay. that uh, there was supposed to be an image of one of your pieces up, and I don't see it. But so. Oh, it will we... be later. Oh, fine. So then let me just. <laughs> you go ahead. I'll let you talk. Oh, about uh, it. Was it the image of me dancing naked in the snow? No, I said that one was vetoed. I said no. Okay. Vetoed. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> we okay. didn't. We don't do X-rated videos here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Hi, everybody. Well, I have to say that this is wonderful because um, Dave and I are hunkered down in the countryside, and uh, we don't see anyone, and <laughs> so. Oh, I'm used to being here, but then I'm used to going off to sofa, you know, and teaching and traveling around. So this is the longest that Dave and I have been together in our entire 40 years together. And you're still together? We're, it's amazing. I, I love being home. <laughs> now look at this so, little beautiful baby piece you made yeah. for us. So life is not really that different because um, I'm still working. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I have to work a little bit more carefully since I've injured my wrists and my elbows. But I managed to um, blow this piece of glass during COVID and make it just in time for Sandra. Now, I have to say that Sandy um, has waits for me, right, Sandy? Yeah. She says, please, can I have way. work? Please, can I have work? And I say, yes. And I bring her one piece. <laughs> and, and then I sell piece. it and it's like it's a letdown it sells like sell it. that day or the next day so I worked really hard to make sure that Sandy could have these pieces for the Toronto show and um I and really love them I'm really happy that uh, I managed to <laughs> put in this, put in the time yeah this is a gorgeous piece this is full of sunshine absolutely yes. a joyful piece yes i think we have a professional slide of that uh that um i'm going to talk a little bit more about that piece okay so when we get to that we will but yeah so no go ahead yeah no Are daniel has that has that up because okay, so i do believe Adrian, yeah i do i do believe the uh white piece found a home immediately yes, yes we sold the white piece but we didn't take it away. The gentleman is willing to wait a bit and we wanted it here so that we could show show you off, Laura. And it's yes. it's absolutely a gorgeous piece. I remember the first white piece I sold and I even remember who I sold it to, but white was always one of my favorite colors of yours or non-colors, love the white. Mm -hmm. Well, I started glass in 1982 and one of the main reasons I 
loved the material so much was because of the color. Mm -hmm. And for me, the joy of working with uh, an emotional, it was like an emotional experience dealing with each color and how they interacted. So it took me a very long time in my career before I started relating to white. Mm. And one day um, I was out in a snowstorm and I thought, you know what, this is actually magnificent. And it was after um, an ice storm. And so that was the first time I started to actually uh, really relate to, to white as a color that I personally could work with. Mm -hmm. So I started the Amulet Basket series uh, right after 9-11 because the work that I was doing before that was in the, it was called the Witch Pot series and they were large cauldron-like um, vessels with a, a lot of bones and sticks and it was a, a more darker uh, view of life. And so because I had a solo exhibit uh, in Manhattan not far from where 9-11 happened, I realized I had to uh, quickly bring some kind of love, understanding, and joy back into the lives of the people there. And my family is from New York City, and so, um, and one of my cousins was in the towers, but managed to get out just before they fell. It was a very uh, emotional time bringing the work to New York and seeing the smoke still sort of coming out of the of the ground. And so the amulet baskets started uh, so I could bring my own specific joy, happiness, and hope into people's homes. A lot of the other work that I do is about uh, difficult subjects like rape and um, medical misdiagnosis and um, things in my life that I need to ponder the really unpleasant things that I like to work with. So the Amulet Basket is the one series that I do that fills me with uh, great joy and love. And um, so the yellow pieces, I didn't, I wasn't working with just specific yellow until my father, who was a professor at McGill University in Montreal, went after his retirement, he went to Washington DC to the Holocaust Museum and he found uh, lists of uh, the people in his family that had been murdered in the camps. And he didn't know this before. He was just looking up their names. And um, so when he came back, he was visibly upset because his family never talked about it. And in fact, he did a lot of research about the family who was murdered. And one of them uh, was a glass merchant. So this information is very interesting to me and I will continue to, it's very hard to get information out of the, those years ago. But so I decided then I was going to do one piece with was just yellow and I called it the yellow heart, the Geld heart. And it was to take yellow back, it was to honor all of the Jews, not just my family, who were murdered. And I wanted to take the yellow star, the symbol of the yellow star, and turn it into something so joyful that it wouldn't be a demeaned color any longer. It would be hope for the future. So I made one ye all yellow piece and it was purchased by a Holocaust survivor. And I was never going to make another one. It was in honor of my father and in honor of my family and in honor of those who have perished. And then other people started coming up to me and saying, please, we would like, we would like our own yellow piece. So I would make just one a year or one or two a year. And each time I make a yellow piece, it is with a great, um, it's, 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 it's with a sorrow in my heart that is combined with uh, a great love and hope for the future. And Daniel, if you wanted to go, oh, wait, wait, I just wanted to say, so you see the rays that come out like a sun ray here, mm -hmm. the hope emanates like into, you know, into the future and it causes like these energy lines and the color of glass does that. It's so joyful that it can bring amazing um, happiness into people's homes. And these, these pieces all go into people's homes 
And with every piece I do, I, I sew and bind a little bit of myself into each piece. And so it is my personal gift to uh, whoever has the piece in their home. And so I'm kind of vibrating in a happy way. This might creep some people out, but, and inside each, each basket is a little amulet that, that I create for, for the person. Um, Daniel, could you put it back on? Yeah, so I'm not sure if you can see me here. I have a little example. The thing about glass people is that we all start off with exactly the same material. So here, here's some batons. It's solid glass, it's solid yellow. And so one of the joys of being an artist is that you actually, nobody tells you what to do. It doesn't really come in a book. Over the decades of working, you invent yourself into the art. So I've had to figure out that this is one of the uh, spikes that go onto the piece. And so I had to figure out how to make the glass and then uh, make it with these wires. And so the, the good thing is, is that I can attach the wire and onto the piece. And if it breaks, then I just take it off and put on another one. And so here, this is a hunk of pure yellow color and all glass blowers, Martin Yanecki, Nancy Callan, we all start off with the same thing. And then you have to know technically what to do with it. So that is the pure yellow that will be on that piece. And then here are some little additions. So I spend like, like all artists, I spend, okay, you can put it back on the piece now. I spend thousands of hours creating all of the different components with, you know, when you're in the, in the hot shop, it's fun blowing glass and you're having a great time. Then I go back into my uh, flame working studio and then I make all of the components. And then I take them into a quiet room and it's like kind of like a meditation and I bind it by hand all together. So there's no glue, it's all bound and sewn together. And while I'm doing the binding and the sewing, I feel like I'm trying to put the world back together, in, you know, in a loving manner. And Lord knows we, we need that now. So it's, these pieces are made in uh, different, uh, different, time frame. So first I blow the glass, then I, which is a lovely, lovely thing to do with your friends. COVID has made it a little difficult. Then I make all the components and then I attach them together. I always think of my best friend, Susan Edgerly, when I make the clear pieces, because she taught me about shadow and <laughs> how not, not call, no, Susan and I have been best friends for almost 40 years and our one big fight was over color. And it was, is this orange? No, it's salmon. No, it's orange. Anyway, it was a ridiculous fight, but we I'm made it. I'm glad you resolved it. I'm glad you moved forward as they say. It's salmon. <laughs> no, it was orange. Salmon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know we're very silly. I must admit, when I saw the yellow uh, basket, I saw it as a very hopeful piece. Mm -hmm. And the first time I saw one of your your yellow pieces, it just hit me that way. It was so full of joy and hope. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad that you shared that uh, the story about where it really comes from, where the yellow comes from. Mm -hmm. It's very moving and very mm -hmm. touching, mm -hmm. for sure. Thank you. Laura, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you'd like to add about um, your process well, or just that we all love your work? Well, thank you very much. You know, I have uh, all the other work that I do is sometimes so difficult that for me, working on the amulet baskets um, give me a burst of hope, love and joy as well. Yes. I'm working on a, a solo exhibition now that's going to be in the States in 2023, and it's all very difficult subject matter. So I work on that for a while. Um, I'm painting again. I'm going to have a painting exhibition in the States as well. It's all very difficult. 
subject matter. And so when I go to my amulet baskets, that's my, that is kind of like my hearth, you mm -hmm. know, so I, I can come and rest in, in, in the, in the so, love that I, I make these pieces with. All right. It's, it's a place called home. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that home. title. Good. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Laura. Thank you. I'm sorry I don't get you enough work, Sandy, but I'm trying. Uh, you should be. And I noticed you didn't mention our show, the show right. that we have planned. Remember, you and Susan oh, yes. and oh, I Irene. Didn't know if, I didn't know if we could mention it yet. Yeah, well, we, I guess we could, seeing as we're here with a lot of other people. What date was that? 2022. There you in go. The, in the fall. Good. Exactly. 40 years to the day mm -hmm. that Susan Edgerly and I met at Sheridan College where we were studying glass together, we're going to have a sh two person show at Sandy's. There you with go. With Susan with Edgerly and mm -hmm. myself. And we're going to do one collaborative yeah. piece as well. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Great. So we made our announcement. <laughs> okay. Now it's written <laughs> now in ink. Now we have to do it. Written in ink. <laughs> so we're, we're going to move from Laura now. I've got to say goodbye. And I'm going to. Um, show some of Preston's work, but Preston and Preston with um, Joe David. Um, most of you are familiar with uh, Preston Singletary. Uh, you might not be quite as familiar uh, with the collaborative pieces that he does with Joe David. Uh, and Joe David is a Canadian um, native artist and I believe very much of a mentor to uh, Preston. This particular Raven is just by Preston. And I guess whether I should be mentioning it at all, but I did read this morning, unfortunately, that Preston's father has passed yeah. away. Yeah. yeah, which I just thought I would, I was touched by that. I think he was very close with his family. And we're moving over here to the collaborative piece. We have a few of these, and this is the one collaborative piece that we can show you today, the very powerful, um, strong pieces. I'm, I'm very drawn to them, actually. I hope some of you feel the same way. Very imposing, mm -hmm. very tribal. And then we have one other smaller piece by Preston. Much more intimate a piece, but lovely. This little piece has become a favorite of mine. That's beautiful. It is. <laughs> yeah, very soft, but just beautiful. And um, we do have um, a video that we're going to play. Uh, it wasn't that long ago in June that we did a visit with Preston and here he is. Hi, so ben. I wanted to show you some of the pieces here, some detail shots of some of the pieces that uh, you uh, would, that, that are represented in this particular show. This is the octopus hunter um, so oftentimes we'll, uh, Joe and I will conjoin our imagery. Um, and so the top figure, this is based on a new channel, uh, um, uh, form, usually a small and a small fetish kind of version. Uh, but these are large. They're about, uh, a little over a meter tall. Um, but that that mask is actually um, a very traditional Nuchanoth mask. And so this one is called Firekeeper. This is one, uh, another piece in the show that we've done together. But this this is a very prototypical style of, of mask um, that you would find in the Nuchanoth culture and some of, uh, uh, you know, so, and, and this marking is uh, very much about, uh, you know, the new channel style as well. So I do the blowing and sometimes I'll add details to these pieces. This one's called Feather Keeper. Um, another uh, shot at that mask. And this is uh, uh, some of the design work that I put on the back. So sometimes Joe will do the front and I'll do the back. Uh, but these pieces to me are very significant because um, because of Joe's uh, stature within the Native community and in history, and um, our um, conjoined efforts into these pieces. This is the, the man who stands in front. Uh, this is, uh, in my, I just gave it this title because it felt like a, a very sort of 
um, imposing chiefly kind of figure. Um, these are on the back. These are represent like the rib, the ribs of the of the person. This is the rib cage. Um, and uh, so you can see some detail shots there. It's got a little high iridescent shine to it that gives it a really kind of interesting sparkle. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. These are a couple of pieces I just threw in that I didn't, um, uh, we just got finished, but these are, we call these Thunderbird eggs. These are pieces that uh, um, Joe and I also worked on. They're about um, uh, 13, 14 inches in height, and we just call them Thunderbird eggs. So uh, based on the white raven, so in the beginning of time, raven was actually a white bird in our, our stories, uh, in the Clinkett stories. And so this is uh, showing raven and in his original form. Um, this is a, uh, a, di a dish, a grease dish or a food dish that um, more of a traditional shape, but uh, very simple, uh, elegant form, I think. Excellent. So, Dan, did you have a couple of other images of Preston or is, is that all of them? Maybe that's all. So now, Toots, we're going to go live to Toots. Hey, Toots. Do you have me? I have you. I was a little worried. Okay. I'm having a little <laughs> problem because I switched from computer to iPad because of the <laughs> shifting, and the iPad's more sensitive, and there were some technical glitches. I, I have technical glitches all the time. <laughs> I don't think I could manage all this if I didn't have Daniel that was getting me set up. So I understand technical glitches. But here's one of my favorite pieces. Anyways, it's nice to see you. Thank you. It's nice to see you all and some of my favorite colleagues and, and um, learning more about them as I watch this. So it's wonderful. And um, so here we are. So the piece that you're sort of zooming in on at the gallery is part of a series of um, on endangered species, particularly the, right now of birds, which I've always really loved and grew up surrounded by in a really beautiful natural environment that I was very lucky to grow up in, ran wild in, um, surrounded by woodlands, waterlands, um, lots of dangerous misadventures with my neighborhood gang. Um, and more recently returning to my um, family home, I was sort of astonished that I, I walked down into the woodland and, and realized halfway down that I hadn't heard a bird. And that that was just not normal. And even after sitting quietly, there were no birds around. And when I returned back to Providence after that trip, I started Googling all the birds that I remembered very well growing up surrounded by and one after one they were all on the endangered species list and they flourished there when, when I was growing up and until not that long ago and as I started researching them and and then zooming in and you know looking at their incredible plumage and then and then really studying the relationship between the, the fibers that I work with and the structure of bird feathers which I was always fascinated with I started, um, it just, I, I started working with it and I wanted to sort of bring attention to them and sort of memorialize all these amazing, amazing creatures that, that we were destroying, that we are destroying um, unless we do something about it. Uh, and as we all know, our current administration is doing less than nothing about it. In fact, they're about to undo the Endangered Species Act so um, I, I just, you know, was really compelled by the beauty of, of these creatures and their incredible delicacy. And, and we're all jealous of them, right? I mean, we can't fly and they can. <laughs> and, and so it, at first I started just with the birds from that region. And then 
you know, as I did more research, I had, it, it's just expanded around the world and I found some of the most extraordinary creatures that I have ever seen. And I'm gonna show you one just to give you an example of how crazy they can be. Um, just, can you see that? Yes. That is a real bird. It looks like some kid photoshopped it together, wow. right? It does. It looks it's like three different birds at least. Wow. Crazy. It's called a short crested coquette and it comes from the region of Southwest Mexico. And it's of course endangered. Why? Because it's so beautiful. So it, it, it's also led me to do a lot of thinking about why it is that human beings become so jealous of, of you know, beauty in the natural world that we want to destroy it because we want to own it. Um, so instead, you know, I figured I'd make some nice pieces of birds and people could own them instead of the birds themselves. That but, looks so beautiful. So this, this, these colors, uh, and mm -hmm. I lift this up so you can see it. So, you know, it's also just, again, expanded my, my vocabulary in using color. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that, you know, a lot of things are said about inspiration and everyone has a very different feeling about it. You know, people say inspiration is cheap, inspiration is for amateurs. I've heard that from some very well-known artists. But I mean, we all are inspired by certain things, whether very directly or very or indirectly, you know, as we assimilate it in our brains and it sort of seeps out through the cracks in our face. So, but this is, um, it's a great pleasure for me because I do a lot of research on birds, not only about their physical visual self, but their habits and their habitats and how their habitats are being destroyed. Like we've lost so many because of wildfires and people think birds can just fly away. Well, they can't necessarily. They get caught up in the intense thermal and heat and, and sometimes the speed the smoke, that, the smoke um, you know, their nests are destroyed and, and then they have no habitat to come back to. And they, they do usually come back when they migrate for the winter, they come back to where they came from. So it's very disorienting, disturbing, even if they do survive. So there's just a lot going on. Um, and the piece that, that we were looking at in the gallery is a red knot. And that, I, I believe it's the one, the bird that migrates the farthest from like north to south and makes maybe one stop on the way and um, it's, it's just has extraordinary stamina. And, and then when I, I heard about it, and then when I started looking at it, it, the plumage is so beautiful and so, so elaborated. It was a real challenge to kind of start, you know, stop oversimplifying what I was looking at, which would have been really easy and really delve into the complexity of it. So, you know, the study of this really challenged me also uh, to not be lazy. <laughs> um, so I, I again, I, I really love working on my work. Um, I'm sure that's shared by all my co colleagues and I think it, it shows in everyone's work that it, it really is just a part of us and, and it's, mm -hmm. it's what I am and who I am, a good part of who I am every day comes out in my work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a favorite one. Maybe we'll take a second and let everyone see some of the other uh, pieces that are available from Art Toronto. The light is, is really bright on it. So I actually brought that, I have that piece still in the studio. Since Art Toronto was going to be online, we decided I didn't have to send it right away to the gallery. So here it is in the Let's studio. Okay, can we switch back? Okay. Um, there it is. Oh, okay. That piece looks magnificent to me, Toots. Wow. I don't usually keep my pieces around me in the studio um, because I'm a little bit too casual about them. So it's not safe for them to be around me. I think so, that's what you call a wow piece. It really is a wow. It's great. Mm. So I just brought it up. So you guys. Thank can, you. Thank you very much. Scale. It's, it's weighs a lot too. Um, and I also get lazy if I have too many pieces around me in the studio I just 
feel like, oh, there's plenty of pieces. I don't, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There's a few angles of that piece. And here's another piece, which is beautiful. The violet and green, gorgeous color combination. Those were, I think, Matisse's favorite color combination was that beautiful. This one? Mm -hmm. I love that color combination. I'm going to go, and it kind of stuck in my head. Yeah, I've seen you work in that color before, different forms, but with that mm -hmm. combination of color. And yeah, I'm a green that. person. Everyone knows I like green, so here, here we go. I love this color. Well, you know, I grew up, in, and it was real... It's been a, a, a lesson to me my whole life about the danger of, um, you know, imposing like restrictive ideas on children because in first grade, and, and I, I, you know, I loved, I already loved art and I loved music. And in first grade, I had a teacher who, you know, I'm sure with all the best of intentions or she had learned it at teacher's college, she had a color shot on the wall and it had red, orange, yellow on the left-hand side, you know, one below the other, and then opposite, green, blue, purple. So red was opposing green, orange was opposing blue, and yellow was opposing purple. And she said, you can never put these colors together because they quote unquote, flash. <laughs> and I thought, oh. And then I thought, well, that's sort of stupid. I mean, my mother, <laughs> beautiful red rose bush and has green leaves and it looks really beautiful. Is there, what does she mean? It clashes, but it really kind of inhibit you. Even if you're, even if you're, you know, pushing back against it. And it wasn't really until I lived in Africa in 1984 to 85 that um, my whole idea and, and, and use of color was just, you know, then totally liberated. And I realized, wow, I've been living with that, whether I thought so or not, all these years, you know, that these colors clash. So I, I absolutely, with a vengeance, started making pieces that had all those colors clashing with each other. That, um, that, remind, that reminds me, Do you remember when we were kids, they used to say blue and green should never be seen except when in the washing machine. Remember that? <laughs> Anyways, and someone should tell that to um, Laura, but she can't put colors together. Yeah, so you have to be really careful what you tell kids. It, it can stick too hard. Mm -hmm. So I spent the rest of my time sort of liberating myself from... from <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it's, it's wonderful to see you working on the new piece as well. It looks well, like it's going to have a, a white base similar to what, what's in the gallery? The piece in the gallery? Just the paper. Oh, what about the other side? Sorry. It's On the other side. It looks like it's glass, but maybe it's not. Um, it's and it may be going well, but it's a real beautiful, uh, it's a rare earth element and it's, uh, it reacts. It has great sensitivity to the quality of light. I see more of a pink toned lavender or a blue toned lavender, depending on if it's daylight, incandescent light, fluorescent light. So it's kind of a, one of my favorite colors. And it also enhances every other color, um, which is odd because some colors will really dull out the other colors when the light goes through it. But um, neodymium enhances even greatly contrasting colors like, you know, greens and reds. Or, or yellows, and you wouldn't think that that would work, but it, but it does. So I, that's why I line this piece. So I actually, you're seeing two, two phases of a piece here, which I did on purpose so that everyone could see it. So this is usually the first layer. Um, and, and it continues underneath this, obviously, but this is what is the filler or the body of the piece, which gives it its thickness and strength. And these outside layers are, will come up and wind up on the outside of the piece. But because the colors are so intense, they're sub slightly subdued, but you can also see them through. Sometimes I put an interior liner of opaque white that you never see, but it, it'll block. 
Mm -hmm. It'll color on the inside from the outside so it doesn't, the inside color doesn't affect the outside layers of color so much. Um, so this is just really fine rice paper, which is gonna burn away completely. Okay, well, I look forward to seeing this particular piece. It looks like it's gonna be a beauty. Maybe. Um, pardon? Trust. Yes, that's it right. There's a lot of processes to go through, thank you. So, you know, I was going to um, ask a couple of questions, but I wonder if I shouldn't open this up to the people who are with us and do a Q&A first. Uh, we, we've, if you want to ask a question, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And if you type a question um, and indicate which artist the question is for, we can take a few questions now. And then maybe after I'll ask all of you a couple of questions. But I think we should open it up. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question? And how disappointing would it be if no one does? If no one does, I always have questions. I think we're gonna have some questions so, rolling in the next couple of minutes. So maybe you want to ask- Maybe I'll end. ask a question. What I'd, what I'd like to know of all of you, I mean, we're all here today because of COVID and uh, art fairs um, being virtual, but how do you see the future of art fairs going forward next year? What do you all see or what are your plans? What's in your mind? Whoever wants to answer is fine. Oh, Tim has a good answer. <laughs> okay, Tim, what do you think the future holds? Well, I think most of us by this time realize that in-person art fairs will come back, but they will not represent the entirety anymore. There will always be online components forever. And certainly for the near future, mm -hmm. we are all online. Now, That's that true. may sound bad, but it, there is glimmers of hope. Uh, many of the fairs have not been successful until SOFA and GlassArtFair.com. Those two have found ways of being partially successful. So we're starting to see a glimmer of how we'll handle being online and how that'll result in keeping artists alive and how it'll, how it'll engage with collectors and museums. So at this point, I think that it's only, you know, we're, we're, it's a transitional time and with transition comes opportunity. So if you are a new artist starting off, I believe it's the best time you could ever start off. I'm gonna be contrary to what most people say in the sense that there's not, the gatekeepers aren't always there now. You have control of your destiny of what you make. You have many accesses to show your work this is a great time to be an artist, even though it's a tough time right now, a great time to establish your voice though. There you go. Actually, that was going to be my second question. Oh. You know, what would you suggest to, how do you see the future for emerging? Or if you were a 22 year old just getting started, what would be the route you take? What would, what would be your destination? What would you like to see happen? Well, you sort of have my answer. If I was 22 and starting off, I would start my voice, but so someone else can have their view of it. I'd love to hear what the others think as well. Yeah. So Susan, what do you think? Well, I actually think, Sandy, that it's, uh, I agree partially with Tim. It, it is a, a, a wonderful opportunity to develop a voice. And as he puts it, the gatekeepers are, aren't so active. The other, the downside of that though, is there's so many people online. I find there's, it's a tremendous amount of information that comes at you. So yes, you can establish your voice that way. And I think it's really important for emerging artists to really uh, like for, I think for all of us here, we're older. We didn't start with online and Instagram, Facebook and all these platforms. So we've had to learn, learn it as we go. Um, but I think for young people, they really know it well, but I would say know it even better. Like it is a, the future, there's no doubt about it. But getting back to artwork uh, and just having online presence, I think it's essential still that the physical is, is because art is about that interaction with the person. It is about the physical. It's essential, I think, in a lot of art making, especially material-based art making 
to, to have the physical spaces, whether it's galleries as yours, fairs, et cetera. And then you can have the online uh, as a kind of um, adjunct or, or you know, a, a nice addition. It goes further, it goes faster, but I still I actually very honestly believe that material-based art really needs the, the physical presence and the interaction with, with the viewer. So it's like a combination answer to tell mm -hmm. you the truth. I, I, I see that more as the future and I'm, I'm hoping that the physical spaces are able to uh, survive this period mm -hmm. because I know it's very difficult for everyone in different ways, uh, but people who have physical spaces, I think it's, it becomes extremely challenging. So I'm, I'm hoping when we get to the other side of this pandemic, that those spaces will still exist uh, for, for us, for us all, actually. Yeah, it's a necessity, isn't it? Yeah, I agree, I agree. But do, do you have any thoughts? Well, I think um, it's been obviously a very unfortunate time for so many people. Um, and I love what you've said, which is they can shut us in, but they can't shut us down. Yeah. And I'm spirit and, and what- <laughs> That was my quote, where is it? I wrote it uh, down so yeah. I wouldn't forget it. What's happened is, is it? <laughs> a lot of people to become more savvy about doing things online and, and looking and, you know, spending time online that normally wouldn't have and having to shop online, even for groceries. Um, and so it's, it's sort of ushered in the, the new age to a lot more people. And I think, you know, obviously we will get past this, hopefully. And it, it's just gonna be an enhancement of, of the physical reality of being able to go to the show and actually seeing and, and touching <laughs> the work. Um, and then, you know, it's expanded the field for everyone. I mean, mm -hmm. you can, today we can be seen all over the world mm -hmm. um, because of the online stuff. And I think it's, it's going to be, it's going to have expanded the whole thing mm -hmm. this whole time. And so I, I think it's really, really positive. It's one of the positive things that's come out mm -hmm. of it, a new kind of connectivity and awareness and and ease and comfort that people feel of looking at things online and understanding them because they have or will see them physically. And when they see them physically, they have the memory of seeing similar things, you know, of that artist online and they, they'll understand it more already. But that's exactly to my point, Toots, is that it's the combination that we need. Yeah. You know, it, it is the physical and it is the online for, like you said, the diffusion, and the, the, it just go, it travels so far, so fast. And yeah. that's really, really important, which before physical spaces didn't really have, but you really still, I believe, need that combination. I, I agree, I agree with you, absolutely. So, so things will perhaps be less one dimensional, will be mm -hmm. many dimensions mm -hmm. um, for an artist to present themselves. Laura, do you have any thoughts on what we're talking about or feelings? Well, um, the other day I was on a online, I was, um, it was a critique for a master's student in the United States. And it amazed me that uh, this person could invite people from around North America to be there for her critique. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's actually someone who's shown at your gallery, Priscilla Lowe. And it, it dawned on me that this new generation of artists coming up, uh, they've developed uh, almost a different language to explain their work in, because, because it has to be online. They have to become extra articulate about the language that they're using. Because mm -hmm. before, you know, if I was going to a critique and I was physically there, there was the work. You could pick it up, look at it. Uh, and they could sort of describe it. But now that it's all online, um, I can't, it's just so amazing to me, the, the younger generation coming up have developed this incredible artistic language that they have, they've almost had no choice because they're trying to describe their work to people who can't, like Susan said, who can't actually see the work in person. 
And the other thing I noticed is that this other uh, young couple that um, I've been mentoring for quite a while, their digital skills are incredible. So they've managed to create a body of work and the work is fantastic, but they have photographed it in an incredible way and they've made online books that then can go out to galleries and museums throughout the world, which we, we never did. It was like amazing if someone could see your work, you know, some, par hasard, you know, where they would just come across a picture in a magazine or just see it in some gallery space. So I think the universality of the uh, younger generation coming up is, is quite amazing. And to, it's not to their detriment, that's for sure. But if you're not articulate online, then, you know, you're, you're not going to, nothing's going to happen. And, I'm and just going to fade could, away because I can't do anything online. We'll help you. But, you know, the, the young people, anyone that has learned to adapt are thriving right now. If you are quick to pivot and you embrace our new kind of electronic overlords, you're doing well. A lot of people are. And the, the more people have adapted to this kind of, being online and Zooms and the way they photograph work and how they're showed and the art fairs that embrace collaborations and the shared shared art fairs around on the social media, all those things, strangely, the more successful you are. They used to say, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get. In a way, it's the same thing with this new way. I totally agree. And I've Me seen too. it, you know, yeah. I just see it happening in front of my face. You know, these kids, they show a piece of work at a gallery and, you know, maybe it sells, maybe it doesn't. But then they've made this book. They've made this museum quality online book that I couldn't do in a million years. Mm -hmm. And their, their names are out there. Boom. All of a sudden, just like that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's incredible to me. They're so, so skilled. It sounds like actually, the, pl the platforms yeah. are actually expanding. Yeah, like and they, I'm sure they're they expanding They haven't shrunk more over more. the last. Yeah, there's yeah. more and more that's yeah. happening and that's available and that people are thirsty to see. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that when COVID goes away, you're not going to stop Zooming, you know, with no. your artists, mm -hmm. because I think that's become a really, really popular mm -hmm. way to, you know, connect with your artists. Mm -hmm. And your collectors, right? Yep. No, we've yeah, already I mean, made you know, that. Collectors just, and the yeah. artists together. Yep. And Laura, your work shows beautifully this way. I, mm -hmm. I could, I wanted to reach out and grab that yellow piece myself. <laughs> so you're so. <laughs> not everybody's work translates well. It's why I have to do videos. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, in that's true, year. Tim. It's not, it is not for everyone. And that's also like an adaptation, you know? Sure. Um, and that's why, uh, but I very much agree with you, Laura. It's absolutely stunning. Like when I look at our daughters who are almost 30 years old, and the, the quality and skills they have with social media and, and how to get in, to, how to not only get informed intelligently, but send out information and how they use it. It's just like mind blowing. So it's up to us also as more established artists, I think, to try to, to, to learn those skills and help each other get, get to a certain level that really puts it, pushes it forward. Cause it's, it's, it's part of the creativity of our field, actually. Right. Or, it's, or ask it's, our 30 year old kids to help us. Well, uh, they do. They, they're too busy. <laughs> sure. I'm sure they, they don't. Do. They, they don't do. have time, right? right? They do. Actually, I'm just, uh, for a new work, I'm, I'm actually um, mapping sh shadows. You know, I was talking a lot about shadows. So I'm doing some mapping of shadows uh, in, in, a, in a computer that's now generating uh, for uh, different cutting purposes. And I knew I really wanted to do that, but I didn't have the actual skills to, to go through all the platforms to do it. And I was fortunate enough that my daughter had studied uh, theater and set design that she was able to assist me to do that. And I was able to create the work at least in an experimental phase. And that was really exciting for me to, to be able to get through that so yes young people have like tremendous abilities and it's a it's learning how to kind of harness all those things to to move everything forward in the direction that you want to move it forward of course so so toots have you been able to harness any of your children to help you <laughs> in this new direction or do they say you can do it mom <laughs> Uh, actually, one of my son worked for me for 
quite a few years, and he helped on the um, fine tuning of the last, mo the most recent iteration of one of the thread pulling machines. He and that was prior to him becoming an industrial designer. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't have time to do that. Oh, although if I call on him to do a CAD drawing for a new special um, spun metal mold that I need, you know, he'll do it or he'll find some for me to do it. Um, if I need technical help, um, I sometimes call my grandson who's 15 now. Oh, and yeah. <laughs> I, I, and he's I, probably fantastic. <laughs> help he'll do it or one of my assistants who's you know like 25 or something it's like oh yeah and I go Wait, could you just slow down and her idea of slow going through like you know this the steps you might need on a computer to find something or to transform a photo or whatever it's like no 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 I mean slow you know yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a generational thing for sure. Yeah. Slow. It's slow one thing to motion. learn, but it's got to be slow to absorb it for sure. And very so, user friendly. <laughs> yes, definitely. Laura, we so, can do a dance to the kiln gods on TikTok. Man, we're oh, we're oh, go viral. oh, yeah. Great idea. <laughs> so, Dan, do you have any questions? Otherwise, we're going to keep chatting here. Do you have time? <laughs> do, I think. Do they, you have a so, question? I have one. Yes, I have a question that just came in. It's a general question for everyone. Are there pieces that you have created that you simply can't sell and you must keep them for yourself? This one? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Tell us why. Tell us why. Well, truthfully, uh, uh, Mighty Dave is sitting right over there. So uh, all of the pieces that I make that are not the amulet baskets, I have to keep. So he's had to build like a second shed. The four car garage is full. And um, here's, let's see. This is, I don't know if you can see this behind me. This, all of the shields that I've made, uh, they're all so personal that I can't, I have to keep them. But it's becoming difficult because there's no space or we just build, put up another shed. Anyway, so you've yes. never sold it. You've never sold any of those pieces. They they are not for sale. Are, they, do they ever go into museum exhibitions? Yeah. Yes, yes, and they've come back, and then okay. I, they come back and they live here. And mm -hmm. you know, these pieces are going to the states in two years, uh, where when I'm going to have my uh, exhibition down there, but they're going to come back. Okay. Good. Yeah, and okay. I've also kept a couple yeah. of pieces uh, through, because I work in series, there's like a, a beginning and, and an ending to the series I've discovered, you know, as I, I continue on in my career. And at some point I realized that I was never going to continue making that work again. And I really had fallen in love with a certain aspect of it that uh, I, I, I couldn't give up. Uh, and so I have kept a few pieces from different series uh, that I also send to museum shows and, and get back because they're loans from me, from the artist to, to, the, uh, to the museum. But there's one piece that I would buy back that I sold and I shouldn't have sold, which was when my daughter was born, I made a piece in her honor called Poupe, which means doll. And one of my greatest collectors who might be on this call, who actually have a piece from every series I've made, which is phenomenal, uh, purchased that piece and now it's in the museum in Montreal but as soon as it sold I wanted it back so bad <laughs> go visit it in like the museum that's like, always nice yeah. one of those moments yeah and other than that yes I, now I, I do try to keep pieces that I feel are very like the actually the pin piece you have Sandra at the gallery now in in all honesty is a piece that I would almost consider keeping. I wouldn't be able to put it up at the moment, but it would almost because it, it's like you sense when you're at a pinnacle in certain, in certain, for me, in certain series and you can feel that you're shifting. And so, you know, you're not gonna go backwards. So, you know, it, 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 comes, it comes like a time where mm -hmm. you have to kind of decide. And I think that's important for artists to at least keep, even if it's in boxes, some of the, some of their work through their career, mm -hmm. especially on long careers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm making a piece right now that is going with, uh, it's gonna go with Judy Chicago and Ai Weiwei and uh, Karen Lamont, 
It's going to be at first Boca Raton Museum, uh, and then it's going to the Hermitage in Russia. And it's a piece about the pandemic. And I don't think I'll ever see it. It mm -hmm. was, I worked with the artisans at Barengo Studio in Italy. Oh yeah. It took us months because there are all kinds of delays, et cetera, but we finally finished it this week. And it's gonna to go to Boca Raton Museum and the Hermitage. I don't think I'll ever even see the piece, mm -hmm. much less get to own it. So this one mm -hmm. is, this one hurts because it's a beautiful piece about the pandemic. It's very serious. It's three foot round, solid, lead crystal there's no mirrors in it it's just a lead crystal mm -hmm. and wow. that's going to be hard to not uh, to not own mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you that. never know you might get it back at some point you know if the show that's travels right. you know it Maybe. might end up coming you know back and you'll have an opportunity but yeah it sounds it sounds fabulous it does right. send us send us images we'd like I to will. see it yeah. will. and how about you toots something that you wish you hadn't parted with or sold? I never used to have a feeling to keep a piece because I thought, uh, well, you know, I'll make a better one next week or something. And then I, what Susan was talking about, you end a series and then I've actually bought back pieces to give to my children because still I can never keep them my, for myself, but my husband, um, I had lunch with Laura Vanini Hillier, Anna Vanini's De Santiana's sister, yes. um, and, and um, who we became very close friends with both of the Paola Vanini's daughters and their children um, over the years. And my husband came home from lunch and he said, okay, we have to talk. You know, um, I just was, you know, I mentioned to Laura casually, oh, well, you must have a beautiful connection. Uh, collection of Vanini pieces. She said, no, we have almost nothing. She said, because oh, yeah. we lived there. You know, we lived with it every day. It was being made more every day. We were surrounded by it. It occurred to us to like take it aside separately and claim it for mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. it. Now we have and then of course the fam the company went out from under the family from one day to the next. Mm -hmm. And my husband said, we're not doing this. You have to like keep pieces or you have to give them to the kids. Mm -hmm. So I said, yeah, yeah, I guess that makes sense. So I started at like giving each of the kids one for their birthday and one for Christmas every year. And then, but I told them also, you know, this is like a bank account for you. So if you ever, you know, start something or want to buy a house or, you know, start a business or whatever, you are free to sell these pieces. So I have the archive physically mm -hmm. here in the studio downstairs, all boxed up and labeled. Um, and there were, have been a couple of times where there were pieces that I groaned after I had let go. I thought that was a piece that I actually, for many reasons, would have liked to keep. Mm -hmm. And one of them was just to, to look at it more and learn from it because something new had happened. And, and then I didn't, and then I wound up having to buy it back eventually. <laughs> it's, you know, That's intense. Yeah. That hurts. So I have very few pieces. It's, it's often my kids that go, oh, mom, you didn't let that piece go, did you? And I went, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I actually called one back from Japan to give my son as a graduation present. Oh, how lovely, how lovely. Surprise, because he, he had given up that he would ever, you know, and the gallery wasn't really happy. They actually had a client seriously looking at it. I said, no, it's for my son for his graduation present. I really need it. And she went, oh, I understand. Mm -hmm. So he was very happy to have it back. And mm -hmm. of all the pieces he's over the years said, you know, I'd like to sell that piece, you know, for one reason or another to, you know, buy materials for his work, own work or something. Um, he said, but that one never. Mm -hmm. So that is his special favorite piece. And it's one of my favorites too. So I'm happy it stayed in the family. But I don't like having my work around, which people are always surprised they go to my house and they say, oh, where's your work? But I, I, it's around me every day. I just, I have other artists work at my house and, and I'm happy to be away from my work. That's really fascinating, actually. 
I, then it sounds like, well, mind you, except Flora, you've kept that one series, but by and large, you never get to keep an amulet basket. They're not around long enough. I have one little yellow one that I've kept myself, mm -hmm. but because it has a small crack in it. There you go. And how about but you, Tim? <laughs> have you kept anything? I had a, a very tiny sacred heart. I used to make these blown mm -hmm. sacred hearts and one of them, the color shifted. And instead of red, it went to this beautiful cocoa color. And I thought, oh, I'm keeping that. And that's the only piece of mine I've ever kept. I've, I've owned pieces for a few months and then an exhibition comes and out it goes again. So they kind of come and go. And uh, if, if I really, really love one, I always think I'm gonna make a second and I just never get to it. I, I, Susan knows you try. And then you're, you're 27 pieces past that, you, you know. And that's when I learned, actually, that's what I learned. I learned that you don't go backwards. You, yeah. as artists, we always go forward. Even if we revisit a series in the past, it's never with the same headspace. It's not with the same tools, the same, it's different. So it took sure. me a while to learn just that lesson that you're talking about is that if it's now, it's now. And that's when you, 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 keep, you keep it if you want for yourself or to give to your child family member who absolutely loves it because there's there's no going backwards for artists there really isn't or you take your best friend's piece out of the gallery and put it on your wall and <laughs> you walk out of the gallery with it physically and it's the size of a really? human being <laughs> <laughs> just over Laura there did that to me <laughs> you can have this. it anytime <laughs> you want <laughs> no, okay. straight to your place you guys have been great this has been terrific <laughs> anyone have anything they want to add to life today, life tomorrow, what it's going to be like, what our future, if, we, if only we had a crystal ball, that would be I'm, the answer. I'm afraid, yeah. I think this is going to last longer than we think. Mm -hmm. I do too. I, I'm yeah. with you I agree. I agree. With that. I think we have to be patient mm -hmm. and, and keep positive and yeah. keep, keep zooming. Yeah. Yes. And and keep making and keep, you know? keep like sending it out there in any way it can. Like the, what you're doing now, Sandy, with art through Art Toronto, and it, it's really important to keep those ties because I think it gives everyone in the mm -hmm. field and outside the field hope that mm -hmm. this will pass. And you know, we'll look back on this time and it, it'll be past, but. I think getting through it now in a positive way is very, very important. And you're part of it. you're part of that journey, I think. You know, the glass world, if nothing else, is a very social world. And tight. We are tight. tight. We are like we tight. Have contact. If we don't have the, if we had Tim, no contact, I know. <laughs> oh here, Laura, I'm big, big we're, we, we're, we like hugging. So this is hard. You know this is like a hug right here it's today. Like today. a hug. It's like a yeah. hug. I have uh, so many students and people that I check in with every week because some of them are not doing so well. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Dave and I up here in the forest, we, we know we're safe mm -hmm. and we have enough food and stuff, but there are a lot of people I know, especially in the States who are, who are having troubles. <laughs> but we haven't handled it very well, as you all know. No, well, really have know that sorry to I took, say. we're going to let you have the closing remark because I can imagine. Go ahead. The closing remark, um, there's no sight. I mean, the, the, the numbers are phenomenal. Our, yeah. Well, somebody else's president um, has done a really bad job. He's not my president. I've never considered him my president. He's too off of everything that I believe in. Um, but we're really struggling with this. My daughter-in-law works, she's head pharmacist at one of the local hospitals. And I mean, they got very little respite between the first wave and now, and she's back in the ICU herself with, with patients. I mean, we're all, oh, wow. it, it's not pretty. And the numbers are going general here yeah. and everyone's hospitals are getting filled to max and it, it's not good. It, it's not going away really soon. We know it. So we just hope. Yep. Well, and we, we all have to do our part, that's for sure. Yeah. And stay optimistic and yeah. stay connected. I, that's, yep. uh, that's I think right. Susan said that, but that's some, and the, oh, that's yeah. a beautiful mask. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's nice. Anyways, I want to thank you. I can't thank you enough for being here today.
we could go well, on and you, on, Sandy. but I don't know. We still have a lot of people online. So unless anyone has something to add, I'm going to love you and leave you and tell you how much I appreciate that you joined Daniel and I today and all our clients and friends. And you really added a lot to everyone's life, just a light to look at. Uh, that's sweet. And you are our light as well, Sandy. Yes. Thank yes, you so indeed. much. We, we Thank love you so talk. very much. Sandy, you are yeah. well, amazing. Let's, let's say we'll do it again then. We won't yes. say goodbye. We'll just yes. talk. Say our right. Okay. Yes. Toots. Yes. Bye. Laura. Bye, everybody. Bye, Tim. Bye, Toots. Bye, Susan. Bye, Sandy. Bye, Daniel. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Love you. Bye. Bye.